My, there we go. Hey, all right. Welcome to worship. We're so glad to have us, have you with us on this Wednesday night. As we begin our time together, we're going to begin with some announcements. During this time, if you'd like to pull out the Red Fellowship pad and sign in, let us know that you're here. That's a great time to do that. Next week, we begin Holy Week. Um, on your way out of the service, if you want to stop by either of the TVs in the narthex, um, they've got some handouts that have all of the service times for our Holy Week services. So you can take one of those home, put it up on the fridge, and then you'll never have to worry about possibly missing any of the Holy Week services. While you are in the narthex on your way out of the service, you'll notice that there is a table full of Easter baskets. Those baskets were put together by our Sunday school students and some volunteers. Um, they've got some crafts and some goodies. You'll notice that each basket has a name tag and an address on it. If you would like to take one of those baskets and deliver it to that address, you'd be taking a basket to one of our shut-ins, um, showing them some, some love and letting them know that during this uh, Easter season, we are, we're celebrating with them and thinking about them as well. Um, our offering over this Lenten se season, it goes to our, our um, those from within the congregation who are preparing for service within the church. So if you do give an offering during this season, that's where it goes. Um, I'm very fortunate and thankful to have benefited from that. We also have Aaron Levenhagen, who is studying at the St. Louis Seminary. He benefits from that as well, and we certainly do appreciate that. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the gospel in seven words, but not just the gospel in seven words, the gospel in your seven words. To this point, we have been feeding you some of the answers, but tonight we're going to bring a new aspect to that challenge. Not only the gospel in seven words, but the gospel in your seven words. So that covers our announcements. At this time, we'd love to have you stand up as you're able for our opening song and the procession of the cross. do that yet? Hey, Pastor Ebert's back there like, no, 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 look at your bulletin. <laughs> We're going to do some opening sentences instead. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Our knees bow and our tongues confess his name. Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have as a Christian. We hope in Jesus, the crucified and risen one. Together we proclaim the praises of him who called, out, uh, called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Praise, Praise to the Lord for calling us into the light.
is that Jesus instructed his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. May our Lord continue to instruct us in prayer as we recall what it means to pray, deliver us from evil. We pray in this petition, in summary, that our Father in heaven would rescue us from every evil of body and soul and possessions and reputation. And finally, when our last hour comes, give us a blessed end and graciously take us from this valley of sorrow to himself in heaven. That let us pray. That embraced by the love of God for us in Jesus Christ, let us bring our prayers to him. I cry to you, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. That hear now our prayers, O Lord, as we bring them to you. That, Lord, save us from the sins of the tongue and the flaws of character that fuel them. Make our words honest by taking away our fears. Make our words few by taking away our feelings of self-importance. Make our words wise by taking away our thoughtlessness. Make our words kind by taking away our indifference and irritability towards others. Cleanse our lips for holy purposes, O God, that we may confess you in all that we say and do. We commend all of our needs to your care, O Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. this time the congregation may be seated and we invite forward our children for today's children's message. All right, thanks for coming to our children's message. Today, or tonight rather, we're going to hear this, this story where Jesus, he goes to the disciples and he asks them this really, really big question. Here's what he asks the disciples. He says, who do you say that I am? Do you guys feel like if I asked you that, who would you, like, who's Jesus? Who, does anybody feel like they could give an answer right now? Who's Jesus? Damon, do you think you can, what, what, what might your answer be? Who is Jesus? Say that again? The Son of God. Good. You know what? Peter, one of the disciples, he's the one who speaks up for the, for the disciples. And guess what he says Jesus is? The Son of God. The Son of the living God. Now this is kind of a big, big hard question to answer because we could answer it so many different ways. And we could answer it probably about a hundred different ways. And guess what? You could be right a hundred different times because Jesus is so many things. 
all Lent, when we come together on these Wednesday nights, we've been trying to find new ways for us to tell people who Jesus is. Now, when we talk about who Jesus is, why, why is that important? Why do we need to know, why do we need to be able to talk about Jesus? Do you guys have any thoughts? Here's what Jesus says. He says, when we tell people about Jesus, we help them to know who Jesus is. You guys think it's a good thing? Raise your hand if you think it's a good thing to know who Jesus is. Everybody else, what do you guys think? Is it a good thing to know who Jesus is? Kids, why don't you look around? Tell me if you think you're right or wrong. Yeah, right. So we have to take that pretty seriously. We should always be prepared to have an answer as to who Jesus is. Damon, your response to the Son of God, awesome. We could say that he is the person who takes all of our sin away. We could say he's the one who created us, all these different things. And every time that we do that, we help somebody to know who Jesus is. And that's what Jesus wants for us to do. Help people know who he is. So let's go ahead, let's fold our hands. We're going to pray, and we're going to do a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for giving me chances to tell people about Jesus. Please give me strength to always share his name. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to your seats. At this time, we turn to the word of our Lord from Psalm 145. That I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of our gospel. Our gospel reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
The congregation may be seated. For the last five weeks, we have been coming together on Wednesday nights to explore and consider short and simple and creative ways for us to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Now, this thing that we've been doing, coming together and, and practicing, this was a luxury that Peter did not have. So in Matthew 16, Jesus asked the disciples, he says, who do you say that I am? And so Peter stands up and he, he speaks for the disciples and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now it's, it's more than the seven words that we've been trying to hold ourselves to, but even Jesus looks back at Peter and, and gives him some praise and says that's a good response. He says that Peter has been blessed because his the Holy Spirit has given him this, his faith and provided him with this response and with this answer. Now this answer that, that Peter gives, this is, a, this is a high point for Peter over the next couple of hours. Because in this moment, while Peter is giving a very, very good answer as to who Jesus is, in only a couple of hours he's going to be asked some questions and he's going to give some answers that you have to believe he probably wants back. Some answers that he's probably not too happy that he gave. Because in only a couple of hours, he's going to be asked not once, not twice, but three times if he knows Jesus. And every single time, he is going to give the exact same answer. He's going to say, no, I do not know him. Now, with, with this in mind, it, it makes sense what Peter would, would later write um, in, in his, his epistle, he says this in 1 Peter 3.15. He says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Now, I, I don't want to be putting words in Peter's mouth or, or, or making anything up, but I, I can picture, I feel like I can picture Peter you know, sitting down and writing this letter and thinking about the answers that he gave in these couple of hours. This, this high point of professing who Jesus is as the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then in only a couple hours, then saying that he doesn't even know him. And I have to imagine that when he gives this encouragement, when he writes these words in 1 Peter 3.15, he's hoping to spare us the shame that he felt on that night when he did not have an answer prepared. And it's out of this encouragement from Peter that we've been coming together on Wednesday nights over Lent, and we've been challenging ourselves to find a way to have an answer prepared for the hope that we have in Jesus. Now, during this time, we've been putting out these cards out in the narthex, and we've been inviting you to take these cards home with you and to write down the gospel in seven words. And I wanted to highlight some of the answers um, that, that were picked off of the board here. And I've got four that, that I want to share. This first one says, In Christ, God's yes defeats our no. Pretty good. Seven words, right? It's kind of a, a looking at exception and rejection. Even though we say no, God says yes. His yes is bigger than our no. This one I like, it's a, uh, I believe you'd call that an acrostic, right? It says gospel going down, and then each letter has its own word, and this, this is what it says. God's only son pays for everlasting life. Good, it's, it's creative, it's an easy way to, to remember the gospel, right? And it focuses on the fact that God sends Jesus, and Jesus goes, and Jesus goes for us, in order for us to have everlasting life. This one, it says, Jesus lived, died, rose for our salvation. Succinct to the point. It's kind of like a creed almost. It goes over the different events. This last one, it says this. It says, Christ makes all things new. Dash, even you. I like that one with the even you. Sometimes when we proclaim who Jesus is, people might be on the other end of that conversation thinking, well, that's great that that's who he is, but there's... I've done some bad things. There's no way he can be that for me. So I, I like that this one said, you know, even you. Now, if you want to check out these cards, there's a whole bunch of them on the board in the narthex, and we still have blank cards. We'd love to have you take these home and, and bring them back, and you can still fill them out. 
Now, I shared these responses with you for two reasons. First, because they were good and they were worth celebrating. And there are a whole bunch worth celebrating on the board in the back. And the other one is, if you haven't filled out a card, then maybe this will inspire you to then go out and fill out a card to say the gospel in your own words. Now, to this point, when we've been talking about the gospel, looking at different metaphors every, every single week, we've been feeding you some of the answers. Because each week we've just been exploring a different metaphor, and a lot of those metaphors come up on the cards that are in the back. But tonight, we've got a new part of our challenge. Not only are we going to be expressing the gospel, expressing the gospel in seven words or less, but tonight the new challenge is this. Express the gospel, seven words or less, and they have to be your words. Your own words. Now right off the bat, let's acknowledge a couple of things. That might be kind of intimidating for some of us. You might be thinking, well, it was really nice when you gave us the answers. Why can't we just keep doing that? You might be thinking that it's just downright scary. Maybe it's too much. Maybe it's too personal to put it into your own words. Now, for those who might be in that case, we're going to do an activity. And what we're going to do is we're going to have... Tony is still over at the organ. And Tony's going to be playing some of our favorite best known Lutheran hymns. And you're going to notice that the words are on the screen, but there's going to come a part where the words are not there. Not only will the words not be there, but Tony is also going to stop playing at that section. So even though Tony stops playing, guess what we continue to do? We still sing. All right, so Tony is going to lead us in this. He's going to give us a little bit of the melody, and then we're going to start singing together. And we're going to sing nice and loud and, and nice and proud, and we're going to figure out who the phonies are. We're going to figure out who, who knows the words and, and who doesn't. So here is our first one. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. Tony, take it away for us. I feel like, did anybody get that wrong? Be honest. No? Okay. Good. That was, that was a gimme, I think. So now we all know what's happening. We're going to do this two more times. All right, so here's our next one. Go ahead, Tony. We were a little bit less confident about that one. What's the correct word? You guys can say it. And storm, right? Fierce through the, or firm through the fiercest, fiercest drought and storm. All right, we've got one more. Here we go. had harmony there. That was good. All right. See, now, the whole reason we're doing this is to show us that we've got certain things that are just imprinted in our mind. Peter's writing to us to tell us, you need to have an answer ready. You need to have a, a way to respond. You need to have it ready to go. 
And you know, this shows us that it's, it's possible. We can. We can have an answer ready to go. We can have it locked and loaded and, and stored there for whenever we need it. Now, maybe you're thinking, hey, this was fun, but the music, the music probably helped me too much. Maybe you were looking ahead thinking like, well, I had the word, so I had the context. I figured out like what word was going to rhyme with it or, or whatever that may be. If you're still skeptic, I want to try one more thing. I'm going to say something, and I just want you to respond the way that you believe feels natural. You guys ready? Yeah? Okay. The Lord be with, or this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. He is risen. Marco. Polo. I wanted to throw one non-church one in there. See, now, I bet you could probably go 10 years without saying any of those things. But in 10 years, if somebody were to prompt you with, with one of those, you know, beginning prompts, it would probably click right in for you. Now, why is that? It's because you've practiced. It's because you are prepared. You have imprinted these responses in your mind. And Peter is giving us the encouragement to have that kind of imprinted response in our, in our mind, on our hearts, for who Jesus is. So we should, we should pause here just for a moment to acknowledge two things before we get to our final point. And the first one is this. We should have an answer prepared. The second one is that, as we can see now, we are completely capable of having an answer prepared. And the final thing that we're going to get to tonight is that there is power in having a personal answer prepared. There's power in being able to express the gospel in your own words. And I've got a couple of examples, a couple of stories that I think really kind of highlight this. A couple of years ago, I was wrapping up a Bible study with one of our high school small groups. And we were, you know, we were coming to our end and I decided, hey, I'm going to ask one of the kids to close us in prayer. And so I ask that question and I look around and everybody's doing everything they can to avoid eye contact with me. And so they get crickets and so I did that mean thing that teachers do when, when nobody raises their hand and you just call on somebody even though their hand wasn't up. And so I decided I was going to call on this, this one youth. Um, this person was in youth group almost every week, in worship almost every week, very often, very easily asking questions, res responding um, to, to my questions, very easy to back and forth. So I called on this youth. You would think that I asked this person to do the weirdest thing. The, the look that she gave me, you would think that I had asked her to like do an interpretive dance for 45 minutes in front of the rest of the group. This was too much. It was too much for this person. It was uncomfortable. Um, it, was, it was just too much in that moment. On the opposite spectrum, I grew up with somebody who loved to pray. This person absolutely loved to pray. Every chance that he had to lead a group in prayer, he was the first one to shoot his hand up and pray. And so he always prayed for us, and he always started his, his prayers in the exact same way. He would start prayers like this. Hey, Papa God. And then the next, next week we'd be together, he'd offer to pray. Hey, Papa God. Hey, Papa God. Every time, hey, Papa God. And at first, when I was younger, I thought, okay, he, I think he's just being funny. I think he's just, you know, I've never heard anybody pray like that. I think he's just trying to make us laugh. And then, as the years went on and he continued to pray like this, I realized he's not making any joke at all. He's entirely serious about addressing God like this. And when he did this, not only was he not making a joke, he was making a confession as to who he believed Jesus to be, who he believed God to be. For him, every time he prayed, it was, hey, Papa God, because he saw God as this heavenly father who loved him, who embraced him, who welcomed him, who was completely approachable. He saw God as somebody that he didn't have to hide anything from. It was always, hey, Papa God, we've got a lot of stuff going on. I've got a lot of stuff going on in my life, a lot of things weighing heavy on my heart, and I'm here praying to you to just to lay them out and let you have it all. He never had to hide who he was or, or, or what was going on because 
that was his confession of, of who God was. Now, here's why I'm sharing these stories with you. Each one of us is uniquely gifted to prepare an answer for who Jesus is. We are each uniquely gifted to have our own answer ready and prepared. And there's a very good chance that of everybody here in this sanctuary tonight, if you were to put the gospel in your own seven words, there's a very good chance that you may put them in a completely unique seven words. You probably won't have the same seven words as as anybody else. And Jesus knows this and Jesus uses this. And he puts us in the path of people who need to hear this life-giving gospel, quite possibly putting them in our path because he knows how well our unique seven words, he knows how well he has gifted us in order to be able to, with his help, reach those people and give them that life-giving gospel that they might so desperately need. And when he puts these people in our path, there's something that he wants. He wants us to be prepared. He wants our answer to be imprinted on our minds so we can give them the gospel. Now, when Peter gives Jesus this answer saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus responds back and he says, you know, Peter, you are blessed because you know, the Holy Spirit has given you your faith. The Holy Spirit has helped you to have this answer prepared. But Jesus doesn't just stop the conversation there. He continues on in verse 18. I'm sorry, 15, 17. Ah, where are we going? Oh man, I'm like totally out of sorts. Here we go. This is what he says. It's not, I've got the right verse on the top left, not on the, on the bottom. He says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And what Jesus is saying is that he builds his church on the confession of the people. When the people have an answer prepared to confess who Jesus is, Jesus uses this to build his church. So our Lenten series, it it all comes down to this. Have an answer prepared. Use the words that God has uniquely given you. And be confident that when you give your unique answer, that Jesus will be at work building his church. So with that, let's go ahead. Let's go to God in prayer. Let's thank him for the gifts that he's given us to be able to express this gospel. Father, we thank you for sending your son. We thank you that you've given us not only your son, but you've given us all sorts of different gifts and abilities. We thank you that you've um, given us the ability to have an answer prepared and that that answer can be unique. And Lord, we thank you that you can use our unique responses, our unique confessions in order to build your church. Help us go out into our world, into our, our community, and to boldly proclaim who you are so that you would continue to be at work there. All of these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, we continue on with our prayers of the church. I invite you to please stand. So we go to our Lord in confession as we lift our prayer to him. Said Father in heaven, you call us always to be prepared to share the hope we have in Christ, but we admit that we have not followed this command. We are often unprepared, and therefore we have been reluctant to confess your name. The causes are many, pressures of the world, fear of embarrassment, misplaced priorities, lack of prayer. Behind them all the sin of us that we fail. Father, forgive us. Look not at our sin, but at your Son. Father, strengthen us. Fill us with the confidence in your gracious promises. Father, prepare us. Give us your words and lead us with your spirit to confess faithfully your holy name. Said brothers and sisters, God is merciful and kind. He does not leave us in our sin but loves and forgives us in Christ. As a called and ordained servant of the word, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
And so indeed, on the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, that he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. That as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.
Please stand. They go now in the very gifts of this Holy Supper, strengthened in your confession of faith and in your witness to others. That as our day and our worship comes to an end, let us now pray for the peace and stillness that God alone can offer. O oh Lord, our saving light and our shelter in the day of trouble, calm our anxious hearts, strengthen our faith, and lead us in your straight paths until we see your surpassing goodness in heaven. This we ask in the name of the name of Jesus. Amen. The Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at last. Amen.